You're listening to The Falconry Podcast with Ben Woodruff. Hey everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another episode of The Falconry Podcast. I'm here today with John Griggs. Hey everybody. John and I have been uh, doing these podcasts talking a little bit about falconry and John runs the Falcon's Ledge YouTube channel. John, you want to tell everybody a little bit about your channel? Yeah, I do uh, a lot of um, flight sim, space sim, and a lot of um, hardware reviews on them. We just recently made our yearly goal for subscribers pretty early in the year, so I've made another one, and if you're interested, you can always go over there and make a comment on any video, and we're going to select a random comment between now and when we make the goal to win a Star Citizen $80 starter package or a DCS module. So if you like flight sims or space sims, go check it out. Thank you, John. Everybody, please check out his videos on his channel. Uh, if you look down in the description of this podcast, you'll see a link to his channel, The Falcon's Ledge. And uh, so, yeah, please go check it out and see if you can win. I do some falconry videos, too. So, you yes, know. <laughs> they'll be increasingly more, too. I think uh, yes. this is going to be an interesting year. John's getting a Peregrine Falcon this year if everything goes well. So going to be uh, so excited. that. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. Well, today we want to talk a little bit about the flight style, the old traditional flight style called waiting on. Now, if you're uh, new to falconry and not, not quite used to that term, waiting on, you think about all raptors can fly and there's different flight styles. You can have a bird chase prey right off of your fist or follow you from tree to tree or uh, maybe kind of, you know, fly into the wind above a hill. But waiting on is really the grand experience of falconry which is taking a a falcon typically a large falcon a peregrine a jeer falcon saker something like that and training them to uh circle above you hundreds of feet or even thousands of feet above you and if there's wind you're training them hopefully to go upwind circle up above you and to set their wings up that high And then you or your dogs are going to flush up the prey, a duck, a grouse, a pheasant, whatever it may be, and your falcon's going to dive hundreds of miles an hour and uh, knock that bird out of the sky, which is absolutely breathtaking to watch. And you think about it, uh, John and I were not just falconers, we're both lovers of nature. We both uh, were have been bird watchers and avid birders since we were little kids. Absolutely. And I, you know, you talk to some of the really experienced birders and they might, you're like, what's one of the neatest things you've seen? And they might tell you an experience. Well, one time years ago, I was lucky enough to watch a, you know, wild peregrine dive out of the heavens and knock a duck out of the sky. And, and it's like, that's just this high mark of their life. And that's why this waiting on style is so fun, because if you're a falconer, uh, yeah, you're training your bird, but when your bird's 2,000 feet in the sky and diving hundreds of miles an hour, I mean, it's as free as can be. You're a spectator at that point when you've done everything right. It's like glorified bird watching. Do you remember um, the first time that you ever met my wife? It was at the falconry meet. It was kind of a, mm-hmm. a fun thing, and... We went out to um, out to the uh, open area and uh, put your. Uh, you had a peregrine at the time, I believe. Yeah, I think it put was it a up in the air. And autumn peregrine. Yeah, put it up in the air. Got a really good pitch, maybe eight hundred, nine hundred feet, and then put out a pigeon. We were doing training, of course. Mm. And so her first experience with falconry, other than you know holding your eagle and all that cool stuff, right? Mm. Her first experience seeing a, a bird of prey fly. Was that peregrine zipping between us at full speed in a stoop after that pigeon? Because you released that pigeon and it turned tail and went right between us. So that was, I mean, that experience was her first experience in it. So that's really exciting. Very I remember memorable. that to that day. The sound, if you've never heard it, if you have, you know what I mean. But mm-hmm. if you've never heard it. Find find you an opportunity to hear it. It's it's kind of neat. It's I call it feathers cutting wind. That's a good description. And I love it's it. it's 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 terrifying and exhilarating. If you're anywhere near it, you're just like it. Just you know the speed of a brick shot out of a cannon. Uh, but yet that they're just you know it's amazing too. At like at the Sky Trials Falconry event, I can't tell you how many times where you'll have a pigeon flying away from a falcon and. And, and Falcon's going hundreds of miles an hour, and all of a sudden this pigeon will just turn and shoom, go under a vehicle. 
for for cover. And the Falcon, top speed, boom, goes under and catches and has the ability to just turn on a dime like that. It's it's amazing. But that's that really is uh, really kind of a flight style that I don't think probably was the first way. You know, falconry in basically every part of the world where it came into existence originally in ancient times, it was just a way to get food. So the easier the process and the more success you have, the better. And that's why uh, a lot of these styles, uh, like, for example, with saker falcons in the Middle East, where the tradition is if you're hunting bustards, which is a bird about the size of a turkey, you know, you don't, you don't, I mean, yeah, a flight where the it's diving would be spectacular to watch but it's like hey no just you know right off your camel just go have the falcon take off and chase it down in level flight and if it catches it catches um and that made a whole lot more sense but over time different circumstances different regions this style came about and it's kind of sad because it's it, it's hard it's not really hard but it takes a lot of work to train a falcon to fly completely free and understand the concept of of this this style of flight and i don't know about you but it seems to me like fewer and fewer new falconers are wanting to pursue that style of flight which is okay you know fly what bird you want to fly and fly the style you want to fly that's okay i think that that there's a lot to be said about um about the experience of a closer catch um Regardless of how amazing it is, a lot of catches in a or or strikes even uh, in a waiting on scenario are oftentimes a lot further away from you. Whereas That's a good point. your you know your sharp shin or your cooper is going to catch something you know within fifty feet of you, mm-hmm. and so e- even your goss might go fifty yards or a hundred yards or you know it's going to generally go be a lot closer to you and i think people get the feeling that they're more involved in the hunt and i think that might be part of the appeal but also the fact that more and i'm not going to say urban hawking but rather hawking closer to home um is something that people want to do because people's lives are becoming more and more and more busy yes and going out into the open isn't always easy yeah it, finding open land is getting so much harder uh and then you're also yeah. looking for open land with prey and hopefully yeah. without uh barbed wire fences or power lines that your bird might hit so that that's a good point so yeah out of necessity is we're getting uh, more and more urbanized that this is a, a much more difficult form of falconry to practice it seems like it's becoming more and more difficult Mm. And, you know, you ask any of the people who do it all the time and they generally have to make some sacrifices to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, if you ask them, they're going to tell you that it's worth it. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've listened to many interviews with prominent falconers who do this all the time. And that's precisely what they say. Is that they just have to make sacrifices, whether it's choosing where they live to be yep. a place where they can fly specifically like there's 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 people who take a job specifically so that they're near good flying and hunting grounds or whether you're going to take a lower paying job just so that you you know can can live in an area that that happens i mean or I'm, uh there's a falcon I'm living that right now yeah. i mean i'm looking for a house in this horrific market and i'm sorry for anyone else who is doing the same it's rough right uh, now <laughs> if you are you know what i mean what i'm mm-hmm. saying um but we are looking in places where I'm going to be able to hunt. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, it's not just a, a lifestyle thing. It's a health thing, right? So I'm trying to find a place where I can practice the falconry that I love. And I want to have the opportunity to fly birds from a pitch. And perhaps I won't do it for the rest of my life. I don't know. But I want that opportunity to do it, and I'm willing to live in a place that isn't close to work to do that. Mm-hmm. And that, there's something to be said about that, too. Like, uh, the past two jobs that I've had for almost two decades now, um, you know, I live in a total separate valley, separate county from where I work. And I, I my thinking was either I want to live close to where I can fly so when I'm done with work, that then I can go home and fly or do what I did, which is uh, work near where I can fly. So it's like bring your bird with you to work. After work, bugger out to the desert real quick and go fly. 
Um, but now that's getting even harder as some of the areas where I used to fly are getting turned into high rise apartments too. It's kind of, they sure are. You remember yeah. what that, those areas out there? Cause I know what you're talking about, you mm-hmm. know, um, you remember what they looked like when I was your apprentice? It was nothing. Yeah. It's like nothing. Every, every time I, every time I go past that one Smith's, uh, grocery store on, on there on Redwood, I'm <laughs> yes. like, I tell Pete new Falconers, I'm like, that's where I got my first, no, my second rough legged hawk. Or like right by the stoplight. There was no stoplight here. There was a two-way stop at a four-way road. It's just like, <laughs> it's, it's just uh, yeah. But I mean, uh, and that's true of everybody, all the old timers as well. You know, it's like everything gets gobbled up. But the sad thing is, is we're seeing the the concept of the edge of town disappearing because right. towns are merging into each other. That's and that's big in, you know, in the Salt Lake Valley, that was, that was huge. I mean, when I moved down there, <clears throat> pardon me, when I moved down there in the early 2000s, um, they were merging, but there were small gaps between them. Mm-hmm. And I remember that. I remember us uh, trapping kestrels much deeper in the Salt Lake Valley than I can now, for example. A 2700 West was quite a ways out there and mm-hmm. didn't have houses everywhere. And now it does. Yeah. It's all changing. Uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. And I think that's a huge impact on flying in a waiting on scenario because um, doing so close to civilization is going to drastically increase your chances of a lost bird. Yeah. Yeah. Because they go with out of sight faster. Yep. You go over one line of houses and where did the bird go? You don't even know which direction to go. Yeah. Uh, and if you're using 433, which is the more popular frequency to use right now, uh, that UHF frequency. It's very long range, right? But 214 or uh, 218 or 216 bounces less. So the higher frequency you get, the more it bounces. So that's why in your house, if you have a 2.4 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi and a 5.8, the 5.8 is faster because it's a higher frequency Mm. and and other reasons. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't go very far. It doesn't go through your walls very well. But your two point four does. That's why they're still both. Well, it's the same thing with telemetry. So yeah, if you're using your four thirty three in town, it's going to be hard to tell all the time which direction your bird is because you're going to get a lot of bounces. Yeah. And, anyway, we're off in the weeds and, on that. But. <laughs> but yeah, any telemetry, any any uh, GPS you're using. Remember, the purpose of those things are not to be able to fly recklessly. You should fly with telemetry or with GPS telemetry as if they didn't have telemetry. Okay? So then, if you do lose the bird or if they get chased off by another bird, then you can find them. Okay? So fly them at the correct weight. Fly them well-trained. All those sorts of things. It's just like, it's just the same rule as four-wheel drive, right? It's like... Uh, don't use four wheel drive to get in to an area. Uh, use it to get out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like you're wiser <laughs> to say, oh, I got in with two wheel drive and I got stuck. Well, fortunately I have four wheel drive and I can get out. If you get stuck when you're in four wheel drive, then you're, then you're screwed. <laughs> you know? So same thing with telemetry, be responsible and fly your bird as if they don't have telemetry so that when you need it, it comes in handy. But, uh, yeah, so that's one of the challenges, but I, I, I really hope that more people, cause it just seems like, and you and I, we're totally all about urban hawking and micro hawking and flying occipiters and finding ways to practice falconry, even if you're living in an urbanized setting. But there's something so special, so just inspiring about flying a, a falcon from waiting on, uh, I, there's this quote that goes around. I share it a lot too. And it's when you pass away, your life will not be measured by the number of breaths you took, but by the number of moments that took your breath away. And that's rather kind of a poetic view of it. And I, it's inspiring, but, but it's true. I mean, th- that's one of the, uh, the chances you have to just, just be amazed. And I think really a big part of that is we're stuck in two dimensional thinking. I mean, we don't think it because we're like, we're three-dimensional beings. It's like, but uh, unless you're a pilot, you don't realize how two-dimensional we are in our thinking. And I think that's something you really have a good grasp of uh, with with all of your diving into aviation in every way that you can. Yeah, perhaps. And, uh, and space sims even more so with six mm-hmm. degrees of freedom. 
Yeah. Uh, but actually, the advantages of uh, taking a pitch, so to speak, uh, probably has its roots in aviation in terms of how humans use it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. Just as an example, I mean, if you'd like me to, to go into this, we can, we can certainly dive into that portion yeah. of it. But um, I w- I'll start with World War II, because World War I, um, the planes had incredible amounts of, uh, or very, very low wing loading, very, very low power. So though altitude was an advantage, um, speed in turns blood like crazy because of the types of wings they used, et cetera, mm. et cetera. But hopefully I won't get too technical here, but there's three basic forms of flight styles when it comes to dogfighting, right? Mm. And you could probably compare some of these to the different flight styles of raptors. So the first and foremost is the kind you're going to find in planes like the Hurricane, Spitfire, the Zero from Japan. These planes had very low wing loading, which means um, wing loading is the weight of the aircraft spread out over the square or the over the area of the wings. So if you have low wing loading, it means you have larger wings with smaller weight, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to make you very nimble, very buoyant. Um, You're going to retain speed because the weight of your aircraft is what pulls you, you know, you're fighting that gravity or that that, gravity, that force, Uh right? That drag, you're fighting that. So that is really the kind of flight style you're going to find with occipiters. Yeah. So these these occipiters, they're usually going to have a really high thrust to weight ratio because they're very light, but they're not all that dense. They're not all that, you know, robust. That's going to be more your bootios, right? Mm -hmm. But they're going to be able to turn on a dime. And if you've ever seen a Sharpie or a a Cooper's or a Goshawk or any of them, uh, hunt they do exactly that turning on a dime accelerating really quick but when it comes to top speed not that not that great yeah they're, they're not that fast i mean they're fast but when compared to a real speed demon like a peregrine or a merlin or a prairie or a jeer they're not even close yeah so yeah that, it's, they're not you're not using momentum as much as uh, as some of these other other birds like parrot like falcons. Yeah. Now, since the middle type in ter- in terms of birds don't do what we would you know consider dog fighting, the middle type would be a plane that's really energy efficient. So what you would do in that case is you would try to get the fight into the vertical so that you're maintaining your energy in a climb, for example, and your opponent can't. Mm-hmm. And you can do things like, you know, rope a dopes and whatnot, um, which is, you know, when you rope your opponent into a bad energy state and then you maintain yours and you can come back down on them. But anyway, mm. um, that one, I don't know if there's a perfect analog in the bird kingdom. You might say, well, I, I, I'm not even going to venture on that one. I thought it might be jeer, jeer but not really. Mm-hmm. But the ones we're really talking about here and the ones that, that waiting on applies to is a tactic called boom and zoom. Uh, in boom and zoom, you are going to want to have an altitude advantage over your opponent, just like you do, say, with a peregrine. Mm-hmm. So your your energy state might be different in terms of how much speed you have. You know, if you got a Drake Mallard pulling up off the water and they're accelerating really fast, and you know they've got a great acceleration on them. But the Falcon, a thousand feet up, has a better energy state, not because of how fast it's going, but because of the altitude that it has. Mm -hmm. Same thing with these World War II planes that use this boom and zoom tactic. You trade that altitude advantage for a speed advantage. Mm. And then instead of trying to get onto the six of your opponent and shoot them down in level flight, you make steep high angle of attack passes on them, right? Mm. Well, once you've blown past your opponent, it's going to be the same tactics that a peregrine uses, right? These are the mm-hmm. same tactics. You're going to use what's called a yo-yo to get back on their tail. In the case of a peregrine where they're very high energy, you're going to use a high yo-yo. You're going to pull vertically. You're going to trade your speed for altitude again, mm-hmm. roll back over, and come back down for a second stoop. And if so- you've watched videos or if you've watched Falcons do this, it's precisely what they do. Yeah, it's the exact same thing. Exact same thing. So you're diving it's absolutely through, amazing. As you're, as you're climbing, you're slowing down, but you're still getting up above for a net, for a second pass. That's right. And so and it's interesting because I don't really know. It's a chicken and the egg kind of a situation. Did these fighter pilots 
recognize the advantages of their fighters and create these things because they're natural? Or was there some sort of observation that occurred there? Because falconry was still practiced and oh, obviously falcons existed. They could see how they fought. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that it came from them, but it certainly grew from the same necessity. Yeah, it's, it's the same principles are applying there, and it's like, hey, you know, people were doing falconry well into World War II, and, I mean, there was even uh, carrier pigeons carrying messages, and there were, you know, forces on all sides that had falconers in the military specifically to catch, you know, pigeons that might be carrying military messages. So yeah. the, so knowing that, I mean, they definitely would have been familiar with those principles of, of waiting on and of a stoop, you know, a falcon diving and making multiple passes at a pigeon to try to take it out. So it's yeah. uh it's definitely possible that, but or is it after world war 1 that people in the sky like you said maybe they were just uh you know falling into line with those same principles of understanding hey if i'm up above i have this huge advantage to come down on another fighter and make a pass then go back up because you don't want to make a pass and then be below them you yeah and up. part of it may just be that it was a it was the perfect scenario to bring that type of style out because there's a big good reason why i didn't try to compare peregrine falcons to modern fighters because the dynamics there are completely different Mm -hmm. they're the thrust capabilities of the fighters are way different the the um, wing loading is different the tactics used obviously the weapons are different so i'm not energy is still a thing and I, i suppose you could use some type of boom and zoom tactics but um but World War II and the the tactics used there just seem to be so similar to a waiting on Falcon. So I think it's a good a good comparison. Yeah, where World War One, you know, <laughs> I mean, even though they had speed, there's so much drag as well. It's and the wing loading was so light with some of those World War One planes. It's kind of like a a butterfly diving. <laughs> Like and, and yeah, they use a, they use a kind of a kind of wing that rather than using. Uh, I guess it's still Bernoulli's principle, but rather than if you can imagine a World War II wing, if you hold, if you were driving along the road and you hold your hand out and you and the air is going perfectly over both the sides of your hand, that's more similar to a laminar flow wing like you would see in some of the late World War II fighters. But mm-hmm. in the World War One ones, you'd have to angle your hand upwards a little bit, and you get that immediate lift. That's because the air is deflecting off the bottom of your of your hand. Mm. That's the type of lift that they used. If you notice, the wings in most World War II biplanes were cupped on the bottom. Huh. And those are great for lift, but they're really bad for speed. Yeah. <laughs> because they create an immense amount of drag. Like, when you see a plane coming in for landing, what do you see hanging off the back of its wings? Mm. big flaps right Mm -hmm. well those flaps are creating that same kind of a wing a a high deflection wing which allows for very slow speeds very high angles of attack that way they can land easily right they can flare Mm -hmm. and land and and have a lower landing speed well that's also why you don't see falcons with these high angle of attack wings they have oh that's right they do have cupped wings but even if you looked at the difference between, say, a turkey vulture's wings and a falcon's wings, the shape, especially of the the underside of the wing, is different. There's less of a cup. the The feathers don't curve quite as hard. Yeah. Well, that's because of the desire to have more speed. Now, an occipiter's will do. They they have much more of a like a negative angle on them mm-hmm. when they're when they're flying. Than a, than a falcon does and the falcon's wings are, are much tighter and and the, the there's less of a space between the feathers and there's so many little things and i get so you know nerded out about this sort of thing so <laughs> but those principles really are amazing because you think about it you know planes almost all planes have fixed wings And so everything has to be, you know, engineered and figured out, okay, what's the drag? What's the lift potential? But you look at a bird, everything we've just said about these birds, everything you've said is is spot on accurate. But then it's weird to think that, okay, I want, okay, like think of a falcon, flap, 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 glide, I get up, I've set my wings, my wings are out, waiting for you to flush a duck up. And then as they dive, they fold their wings in a shape that uh, has... Almost no surface area, 
So there's so you're no longer creating lift, and as you're allowing gravity to take hold of you, you're you're holding your wings and your your face, your body, your feathers in an a, an extremely unresistant shape. And I'm like, and we we were talking about those World One pl- planes where you were talking about how much drag they had. I'm like, oh my gosh, what if they were up there? And okay, now they're gonna dive down on a fighter below them, whoom, and their wings just came off. And they, and they dove can. down, you know, and it's like... They, they most definitely could. Um, the older planes had a... Ha, there's a structural limit to the amount of stress that you can put on those wings, and they would break off. Oh, you like know, a really combination, Yeah, a combination of speed and then also G-force. Mm-hmm. Or, a, a, you know, if you combined a lot of speed with an angular change and that pull... You could easily snap a wing right off. You could still do that in some World War II planes. There, there are definite structural limits with these things, and speed is almost always a big factor because speed is going to cause additional lift on the wing, and when you're creating that additional lift and then timesing it by gravity as you pull, right? Mm-hmm. So you're the 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 weight, the heft of the aircraft is in the center. It's in that fuselage, so it's pushing down on that center spar. So it's, it's pushing the, faster than yeah. the wings are going down. Yep. So if you're gotcha. also adding in that that angle of attack difference where where your plane is still traveling downwards but your wings because you've cranked on your um your flight surfaces yeah, you can really, and that's also where you depart from controlled flight, uh-huh. right? When <laughs> when you're the air is no longer flying over your your wings at a correct uh, uh, angle, you're going to depart from controlled flight and go into a spin or break your wings or whatever. Mm-hmm. Luckily, this is not something we have to worry about with our bird friends. Yeah, they have a uh, <laughs> they can a bit better the control. <laughs> yes, they can, and can. Speaking of adjusting surface area, this is something that I remember reading and I wish I remembered where it was. If you know what article this is, please link it or or send me a message or Ben a message. But I read that the peregrine and I assume other falcon species that also dive, but specific they were talking specifically about the peregrine, that when it stoops, it actually changes the shape of its body and there's a low pressure area um that forms when you have a uh airfoil right and the way that they change their body it actually pushes that low pressure area towards the rear of their body which causes them to accelerate beyond Hmm. terminal velocity so this is something that i think that i had to have something to do with that uh skydiver that was flying a peregrine and and you throw the lure i believe british yep yep Mm -hmm. and they said that that they could throw that thing the lure and the falcon would blow by them at much higher velocities to them. Mm -hmm. And even when they calculated the terminal velocity of the bird, it was exceeding those and its wings weren't even fully tucked. Hmm. They were like, yeah, that bird has a lot more speed in it if it wants it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. So there there is something to be said about more of how they're changing the shape of their body, not just that they're pulling in their wings. Right. So it's, yeah, it seems like it's more than just the aerodynamic advantage of pulling in that surface area. And, you know, obviously they're going to slick down and they're going to pull their feathers tight because the, the less penetration of that air into your, into your flight surfaces, um, the, the less resistance you're going to have. The, yeah. the slicker you are, the, the faster you're going to move through the air. That's well, why if you, if you have to take a skydiver, and you put them in a completely slick suit and have them dive head first, they're going to dive at a much faster rate than mm-hmm. someone falling on their belly in, you know, regular clothes. That per- have so much more drag because that surface oh, yeah. area is increased and is not uh, is not allowing air to flow over it. Uh, yeah, plus your line. your clothes are catching air and acting as a as a deflect you know, as an air deflector and mm-hmm. you know, there's all those different factors involved there. But yeah, so they're going to be slicked down as tight as they can get. And you can yeah. see that in Im- in still images of, of falcons stooping. They they're absolutely tight and you can see that around their feet. So if you get a chance, look at look at a falcon's body when they're in this when they're in a stoop. Unless there's some kind of a wind acting against it, you know. They're they're all very very tight. Their feathers are all sucked right up against their body. Mm-hmm. And their feathers are 
most and we've talked in other videos about species compared to species but in general large falcons have very stiff plasticky feathers and mm-hmm. that helps with the wind resistance you, you know you take a I, I always used to love to show this during educational shows if you have like a golden eagle or a harris hawk uh you know i'd take the tail feather by the tip and show if you do it the right way you can bend it completely the other direction forming a u uh you know shape shape like the letter u and those birds are doing a lot of rough and tumble stuff on the ground with their prey and so there's an advantage to have bendable uh flexible feathers uh with falcons big falcons where their best advantage is to usually dive in from a pitch you know and 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 take prey from the sky then having stiff plasticky feathers gives them a speed advantage but then those feathers are comparatively brittle compared to like an eagle or a hawk and on the ground they can bust them easily when they're struggling with prey which is why falcons have that notch in the beak that helps them bend over snap the neck of their prey which a lot of people think uh, oh see they're humane well raptors don't care about being humane they just want to eat their dinner any yeah, raptor you ever seen has... a cooper sock eat yeah <laughs> it's, it's terrifying it's, it's you don't not, help it's them not dispatch. about being humane <laughs> not at all uh but falcons are wired to snap the neck of their prey before they start eating because Otherwise, they're going to get their feathers all busted up because they have such stiff, plasticky, air-resistant, uh, you know, drag-resistant, I should say, feathers, which is really cool. That's a trade-off, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the strike is also part of that That thing is that they don't always have to struggle as much with their prey because that impact probably takes a bit of the fight out of them, I would expect. Yeah. If, the, if, if their prey isn't killed outright from a strike in the air then uh you know because they're usually aiming for the head or neck and you know they're aiming with their feet do a do a pass by and knock them out of the sky and yeah if they're not dead on impact then they've like you said taken the wind out of them just well that's that's mostly because they don't have machine guns like the world war ii planes (laughs) i gotta use their feet that's right i can't imagine that i cannot imagine like i always tell people okay uh, let's say you wanted to eat a watermelon and let's say you're 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 driving down the freeway going 60 70 miles an hour and somebody on the side of the road has a watermelon just on you know on a post and you're gonna go by with your hand sticking out the window and slam into that going freeway speed oh my gosh can you imagine oh. how you, you would just destroy now I understand that you have the, the the collective energy of the vehicle and that you weigh more and that uh, watermelon weighs more. But still, you ever hold a duck? I mean, <laughs> uh, a, a falcon hitting a duck with their feet, it's amazing that they don't explode. And so, I, I know someone who knows exactly what that watermelon feels like. Yeah. Have you seen the video of the lady that was pulling the watermelon back on the uh, gigantic slingshot? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then it goes back and... <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's her the face, poor thing. She knows exactly that how that feels. Oh, that would hurt so bad. I feel bad for it. I do, too. <laughs> but that... But... but And it's interesting. I had a chance one time uh, we, we, uh, helping out with some taxidermy on a peregrine. And when, when we got down to the bones... On the feet, I was amazed. Those rear talons that they hit with, uh, the legs themselves and the rear talons, the bones were were infinitely denser and more powerfully built. You don't really see it on a living bird. You don't you don't see the difference that much. But their skin is so tight on on uh-huh. it that it's like your brain is like adding in flesh and everything. But maybe there's just not as much. Yeah, and it, it's it's absolutely crazy. Uh, the other one that's weird too, and you know, most almost all birds have these. You know, birds their wings are really arms being used as wings, and they have uh, two fingers and a thumb on each wing, and those fingers are at the tip fused by a tiny bit of uh, calcification. But you can separate it if you look at X-rays and stuff. But their thumb can move up and down, and they have several feathers on those called alula feathers. Alulas. Alula feathers. And the, they are nuts because most feathers, the shaft of the feather is comparative in size to what you would expect it to be for the size of the feather. Not these suckers. They're the, you, you it's a tiny little feather, like on a peregrine, maybe the biggest Alula feather is, you know, two, three inches long. 
and the shaft is like as big and as thick as like a tail feather or a primary wing feather and it's like what and because they normally don't have those out but if they at last minute need to hail mary pass turn on a dime they put those out and have some extra control that they normally don't have but your your those feathers are going to undergo so much more stress than normal feathers are going through and so they need a much more powerfully built shaft in order to withstand that kind of that kind of punishment midair just i think it's pretty cool well, and have you ever seen? Okay, so I was just thinking about this, and and this is just me rolling down through the, the technical aspect of this stuff, having a bit of aircraft knowledge. Have you seen a peregrine diving? Usually, when they, when their wings are about half folded, those alulas stick out. Mm, um, I haven't noticed, and I don't know it precisely if this is what it's what they're for or an advantage that they provide. But as air, so as air goes over the top of a wing. It has to take a longer trip than the air going underneath the wing, and that's what creates that lift, right? Mm -hmm. But the one thing that people don't always know, because they always just see that simple diagram, but air also travels down the leading edge of a wing, rolls off of the tips of the wing, and Mm -hmm. creates vortices at the ends of the wings, right? Mm -hmm. So have you ever seen a a jet fighter pull a bit of g's and have little white things come off the tips of the wings yeah well that's those are clouds formed by the pressure in those vortices right mm, it's condensing and then, the water vapor in the sky right right huh. just like just like you'll see them on the leading edge extensions on modern fighters you'll see big thick clouds well, that's what they are. They're, it's The water's condensing because vortices are formed by those leading edge extensions. Of course, peregrines don't have lurks. Uh, ex- <laughs> they're called lurks. <laughs> uh-huh. um, but they do have wingtip. Mm. And one thing that, that you'll see in modern airliners is winglets. These are little wings on the end of the wings that go up or up and down. Uh-huh. And what happens is that they are made to carry that vortice up the edge and reduce that vortex that occurs huh. on the wingtips. That creates more stability in the wing. Because it used to be that one of the things that plagued a lot of older, faster aircraft were the fact that when your the air would travel down that wing and go off that, that wingtip, it would end up causing buffeting. Mm-hmm. Now, they they found lots of different ways to solve that or at least stop the buffeting from being bad enough to damage it. But so the bringing it back down to it is I'm wondering if that was something like nature's form of a winglet, maybe? That could I don't know. be. I, mean, that, I had never thought about that, but I see what you're saying. Entirely huh. speculation. So, you know, it, please, huh. you know, if, feel free to comment in the comment section down below, but do not treat me as an, as a, you know aeronautics engineer expert or anything like that i am none of those things i'm just a a nerd that loves flight and and is speculating here well it's interesting too i I gotta look up pictures now because i had never thought about it that way but that really could be but it's interesting when you look on larger raptors oh wait i gotta say oh there's one more thing i wanted to bring up and then remind me to come back to individual eagle feathers uh, when we were talking about uh, the sound, how streamlined a falcon is and the sound you do oh, hear yeah. when they're cutting through the air. But yet, I got to tell you, the loudest bird I have ever heard dive is a turkey vulture. And every spring, <laughs> I just two weekends ago, saw some of them doing this. Uh, I don't know. I think this is courtship. I think it's a courtship ritual, but it could be territorial. But I will see a couple of them circling up together. And then one will circle up higher, higher, higher than the first one, and it dives down right past. And then they both circle up together, and then it will dive past again. And it sounds like you are tearing apart the fabric of time and space. Because (laughs) turkey vultures, compared to a peregrine, are not streamlined. They have tons of drag, but it doesn't matter because they fly slow. If you're you're probably hearing that drag, that's that's probably the the sound that you're hearing is is the drag created by that that uber curved wing not only that they have a wing that has a super steep dihedral in comparison mm-hmm. to other uh, birds of prey like falcons they have negative dihedral mm-hmm. um, you know that means that their that their wings when you look at them from the front are actually angled down a little bit 
That's yeah. some fighter jets are that way. They tend to have a negative dihedral, and but you'll see airliners which need to be efficient, right? Just like a turkey vulture, mm-hmm. they have a positive dihedral, which means that their wings kind of face up a little bit or, uh-huh. or are angled up. Same thing with small planes. Small planes are going to be just like your turkey vultures. They want to be as efficient as possible. Yeah. So they have these big, huge, like their wings are really thick and have a really hard curve to them. They're even angled slightly up in the front to create that that wind-catching surface. And so, yeah, maybe the, the turkey vultures uh, sound was because of that. Yeah, it's I. it always is like... The canyon I usually go up and watch them do that is a little cottonwood, and you get the echo because it's a glacial formed canyon, so it's just the the walls are just pretty sheer and just <laughs> you know it's like what did it <laughs> yeah like, and then they just circle back up thirty dur but it just I love it but on turkey vulture <laughs> primary feathers and golden eagles as well any eagle really uh, if you ever hold a primary feather one of those even though it's a very strange shape. The profile, the individual feather, very much is shaped like an airplane wing. It is using Bernoulli's principle because uh, all of those primaries are individually, they're they're notched where, you know, falcons hold their wing feathers together. Uh, But the primaries on like a large eagle or a turkey vulture, they're separated out. And so each wing individually is extended and creates separate lift. And I I just love it. You can, if you... uh, just pinch the shaft of a uh, eagle feather between your fingers of primary and just slowly spin that it causes lift instantly. Not so fast that you're just using centripetal force, but just barely turn it, whoop, and it 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 just creates lift. It's amazing. Yeah. Just how yep. much lift one individual eagle primary generates. It's really cool. <laughs> Well, you know that's uh, it's a um, it's a wing loading thing. My my daughter actually got third place in the science fair because the, what she did was she talked about wing loading mm-hmm. uh, in planes. But what inspired her to do so was birds of prey. She could make that comparison. Absolutely, that's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, that's uh, but yeah, the the eagle that's a soaring bird. So, but you know, they are also pretty amazing at diving themselves. Yeah, but then you also have they 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 are powerful divers, but then of course they have exponentially more weight. So there's more pull, there's more mass, and so yeah. the pull of the earth is pulling them down faster. So, uh, I mean, it's not that's not exactly how it works. You know, I get it, but I'm just saying it's easier to punch through the resistance of atmosphere particulates if you're a bowling ball yeah absolutely you're gonna have a higher terminal velocity and if if you guys are if you guys are wondering you know if if this is just what it's like on the podcast or if this is really what it's like when ben john go on tangents this is this is exactly what it's like. this is exactly two (laughs) men (laughs) both with add both passionate (laughs) about flight and raptors and falconry this is (laughs) (laughs) yeah but i love it though that's and that's what we try to do with this podcast is just it's like these are subjects we're passionate about and like to talk about so it's fun to share and those uh who enjoy uh listening and thinking about some of the subjects can enjoy it too so but uh but i this is a fun subject I, i i think we ought to do some more talking about just flight in general and talk about some of the different structures because i i think it's a cool subject to get into I agree. It. But uh, everybody, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. And uh, again, down below in the comments, let us know uh, what you like, what other subjects you'd like us to, to chat about. And be sure to go down in the description of this video and check out Falcon's Ledge, which is John's channel. And please uh, go over there, hit subscribe, and, and uh, show him some love there. And uh, thank you for listening to us. And as always, happy hawking.